A cold coming we had of it. Just the worst time of the year for a journey. And such a long journey. The way is deep and the weather sharp. The very dead of winter. And the camels galled, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet. Then the camel men cursing and grumbling and running away and wanting their liquor and women, and the night fires going out, and the lack of shelters, and the city's hostile, and the town's unfriendly, and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches, with the voices singing in our ears, saying that this was all folly. If you're wondering what the, what the heck it is I'm talking about right now, those are the opening lines of a poem, a poem called The Journey of the Magi. It's by the, the great English poet uh, T.S. Eliot, a man who had a pretty remarkable conversion to Christianity uh, midlife. He wrote this poem, The Journey of the Magi, and in uh, that excerpt you heard, it's just the, it's just the opening lines of his poem, the, the poet's putting himself into the shoes of the wise men. These pagan astrologers traveling from the east. These people who leave their family and friends behind to follow a star. But really, that doesn't sound like a very wise thing to do, does it? Let's say you were the neighbor of one of these star gazers. What would you think about them and their mission? You'd probably think these guys are nuts, are out of their mind, and when they leave to go on a journey chasing after a star, well, you might think, good riddance. What I love about that poem of Eliot, the journey of the Magi, is how as their journey proceeds and goes, lo goes along, the Magi themselves, they start to worry about whether they have made a mistake. Sleeping outside in the cold with cities hostile and the towns unfriendly? They do wonder whether they are really so wise after all and whether this was all folly. But then uh, T.S. Eliot's poem, it, 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 it takes a turn once the Magi enter a temperate valley, wet, smelling of vegetation. And suddenly it, it, it starts to dawn on them that, 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 may, that their, their journey from the east might just be worth it. And once they finally make it, once they make it and they behold the child with his mother, well, they are satisfied. But I think that not even a, a world-class poet like T.S. Eliot can capture just the feeling of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 10 which tells us that when the wise men saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And actually, in this case, I prefer the language of the old uh, King James Version of the Bible, the Bible that I grew up uh, memorizing in the Christian school that I attended, because in the King James Version it says, And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. I just love, there's something about that phrase, exceeding great joy, that I really love. Because it, 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 it doesn't get any better than that when you think about it. It'd be hard to find a verse that, that captures the feeling of, of Christmas in that, exceeding great joy. But I don't know about you, but one, one trouble I have with this scene is that the joy it's describing, especially if you're reading along in Matthew chapter 2, this exceeding great joy seems so temporary and so brief because you have you only have to read a few verses beyond where we stop today in Matthew chapter 2 you re read past that exceeding great joy of the wise men and then you'll be reading one of the most horrific least joyful stories probably in the entire bible 
So I'm talking about when King Herod, when King Herod, soon after this moment, descends on, on Bethlehem, descends in wrath, and he murders babies in their cribs. So that's a part of the Christmas story that we do not want to think about. And that's because the birth of Jesus, it does not make King Herod joyful at all. Instead, he is filled with fear. He's filled with fear that a king is coming who might one day uh, change things to such a degree that, that Herod himself might lose his throne. So Herod orders the murder, the killing of all of the babies in Bethlehem under the age of two. And that, that, that edict, it forces Mary and Joseph and their child to, to, to go to the land of Egypt for refuge. So, so much for the exceeding great joy of Christmas. And honestly, even when it comes to the wise men, the wise men who see the baby for themselves, well, you wonder. How could they hold on to that joy, hold on to joy in a world like ours, a world with so much darkness and pain, hatred? After all, what they had to go on was only that one brief moment, that one tiny moment of, of seeing the baby, offering them him their gifts, and then it was back to their homes in the east, wherever those were. Uh, I, th I think the, the consensus among scholars now is that they were from Arabia, somewhere like that. But could going back, could returning, could that have been easy? Could it have been easy to go back home and live with pagans who don't know God, who have no clue about that birth in Bethlehem and what that birth means for the world? Even Eliot's poem, The, the Journey of the Magi, by the time it ends, you're, you're feeling not, not just joy, but you're also feeling a bit of restlessness and unease because it, 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 it's later on, they're looking back on their travels and the wise men realize they are no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. But isn't that a bit how Christmas often goes? After that brief moment out of the year where all is joyful and right with the world, well, then it's back to the, the drab, the, the everyday routines of our lives, not to mention the, the, the dreary weather of this time of year. But still one reason it's important. One reason it's important just to, to meditate on those, those darker aspects of Christmas, the ones that we don't like to think about. Because how they do remind us that Jesus, Jesus wasn't born in a, in, a, in a fairy tale land, a fairy tale world where all is merry and bright. Instead, he came to our world, to our lives. And as I already said, nothing gets at that, that better, what that means better than the Gospel of John, which opens by telling us that with the coming of Jesus, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness conquered it not. So when you think about that, well, you realize there really is darkness out there. The Bible is very clear on that. There is even spiritual darkness, spiritual darkness fueled by the devil himself that does the best to, to, to put out the light of Jesus. But then Christmas says that no matter how hard the world, the flesh, and the devil work to snuff out that light, well, the darkness did not, cannot, and will not overcome it. The darkness will not succeed. King Herod will not succeed. Not even the grave where we put him could snuff out that light. And so that's why we can rejoice with exceeding great joy, even when the darkness does its worst. When I thought about what, that, what does that look like, well, a story came to my mind a few years back. It was a, a, after an event every bit as, as horrifying as, as King Herod's rampage. And I thought about uh, the horrific events in Charleston, South Carolina a few years ago, June of 2015. That was when this, this white supremacist named Dylan Roof, he went into this Wednesday evening Bible study at the, the Mother Emmanuel uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church of Charleston, and 
He was warmly welcomed into this evening Bible study. After sitting with that group for about an hour, he then opened fire. He brutally murdered nine members of the congregation. And if you don't remember just how that congregation responded to this hor horrific atrocity, this horrific act of, of racism against them, you should go back and look it up because it is a story that does testify to the light of Jesus that shines in the darkness, if any story ever does. But there was one image that came to my mind. I still remembered it. Was a, it was an image, a, a picture of that congregation only a couple days. It was that following weekend. After the massacre, they were standing on a bridge in Charleston along with friends and some supporters, and they were holding up candles. And it was nighttime, and as they held those candles, they sang that old spiritual, the old African-American spiritual. We, we sang, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. They stood on that bridge and they sang about that light. But the light they were singing about, the light that they were holding up that shone in the darkness of that time in Charleston, well, it was not a light that they had lit for themselves. It was the light that only Jesus brings. And I know it was that light because of how the congregation responded to that killer, Dylan Roof, a guy who had, had murdered nine members of their church family in cold blood. Because not even a week after the murders, members of the church showed up together at Dylan Roof's court hearing, telling him that they loved him. Not only that, they offered him forgiveness, told him they were praying that God would forgive him, that he would repent, that he would, would, would find grace and mercy from God. And the only way I know how to explain a reaction like that to the worst most horrific atrocity you can imagine is to point to the light of Jesus that shines through the Mother Emmanuel African uh, Methodist Church to this day. Because it's a light so bright, a light so bright that not even the hatred, the hatred of a, of a white supremacist could, stuff, could snuff it out no matter how badly he tried. But we shouldn't be naive about a story like that because those congregants in South Carolina, they could not have responded like that to those murders if it were not for a lifetime of training, a lifetime of opening themselves to the light of Jesus Christ. So to become a Christian on the level they are, and by God's grace, I hope that all of us will make it uh, to that level someday. Well, it requires discipline, it requires commitment, it requires study of the very Word of God that the members of that church were studying when Dylan Roof walked through their door. But remember, remember, brothers and sisters, that we love because He first loved us. We seek His light alongside those wise men because He first sought us out. Shining light, shining His light into our darkness. And we dedicate ourselves once more to him as we will do in just a moment with that Wesley covenant prayer. Because he first gave himself completely for our sake. And so now, brothers and sisters, may that light shine on you. May you hear the words of the prophet Isaiah once more and hear them as if they are God's words being spoken to you now. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Lift up your eyes and look around. Behold that light shining into your darkness from this time on and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.